square store. I feel a tiny bit of explanation that joke I made, I learned in, uh, uh, learned Virgil in 10 weeks in a Latin course by Latin. And Greek teacher, wonderful lady from Berkeley. Uh, a wonderful lady from Berkeley opened up her class, learned Virgil in 10 weeks in Latin, reads Virgil in 10 weeks, uh, with that joke, and that joke is is like this: Homer, Virgil, epic writers in ancient Greece used to begin their uh, begin some of their chapters. Uh, and rosy-fingered dawn spread its fingers across the morning sky. Right? So she got up there, and uh, she, you know, she was. I like her, she's got a hip, she began. Let me tell you a little bit about Sappho. There are um, theories that she may have been a lesbian, she we get the word of Lesbo from the aisle on which she had her, um, her finishing school for young girls. And so my uh, Latin professor began her class with, uh, and Sappho taught uh, you know, a finishing school, I'm paraphrasing, a finishing school. It was on the Isle of Lesbos where rosy fingered dawn, and that's a Homeric epithet. But, I, but she cut it, so I cut it. That's uh, mea culpa to, to real people. Uh, um, three little things, real quick, about me and the One, uh, when I was uh, in probably kindergarten in South Bronx growing up, a uh, wonderful teacher taught the class, I'm nobody. Are you nobody too? So I'm sure somebody can do it, so I won't do it. But, uh, and this is probably my first connection with the poet and poetry. But, uh, yeah, she knows exactly how I feel. I am nobody. And she's nobody. And now there are two of us. This is my friend that nobody knows like that. Then it got worse, actually, before it got better. Then in, in high school, in high school, as I was, uh, you know, uh, running around here in Allen Ginsberg, reciting, getting and all these people, uh, when my English teacher taught Emily Dickinson, I don't think he was reading it in the right um, meter right, you know, just the right style. Uh, because it all, I always ended turning to my friend going, it sounded to me like the da 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 I would turn to my friend, happy birthday, Harry. That was my associate with Emily Dickerson. Then, as a professor at ACC, I'm an adjunct professor retired, Adjunct professor emeritus, by the way, I'm suing for that time. I'm you know, hoping I get that time. We all get that time, all day long. Jeff, you know, I'm the faculty. Good work for that time. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I love Whitman because I guess, it, you know, Whitman, even, you know, if Whitman had this macho style, even though it was gay, it you know, was expansive, it was Ginsbergian. And I never caught on about Emily Dickinson because she was like the opposite. And I preferred Whitman. So I would kind of dodge teaching her, you know. And I remember putting uh, on the final um, the word fascicle. And then I, you know, fast go fashion, papers, sticks, like that. Um, I forgot what it meant. So I was grading papers, and the kid uh, wrote popsicle, right? And I gave him credit, so yeah, I right. I didn't know, so his answer was as good as anything I could, couldn't remember. So finally, I go to, I go to see Sophie's Choice. How many of you have seen Sophie's Choice, the movie? Oh, my God. And uh, the actor, I forget his name, he's a fairly well-known actor, was reading Ample Make This Bed, poem 63, by Emily Dickinson at the end of it. 
and it blew me away. I mean, I'm going, I, I get it. So, in honor of uh, Emily Dickinson and in honor of uh, Mel Street and Sophie's Choice, I'm going to read this poem to Sophie Woody thought was Emily L. Emmy Emile Dickens, do you? Goes to the New York Public Library. Do you have she should poll them after the after the war, Christian you know. She goes to the uh, librarian house. I heard this poem by uh, this uh, poem by Emile Dickens. Emile Dickens and then finally she figures this out. I figures out it's Emily Dickens in her boyfriend. The, so here it is. Ample make this bed, make this bed with all. In it wait till judgment break, excellent and fair. Be its mattress straight, be its pillow round. Let no sunrise yellow noise interrupt this ground. All right. All right. So who's next? Who's next? I have a very, very short Emily story. Forty some, forty some years ago, forty-two years ago, when I was seventeen, I uh, I, I had a girlfriend briefly, and we uh, I, we gave each other gifts back and forth, and I gave her uh, collected Emily. And then, you know, me being me, we broke up and uh, we gave each other back things, but she kept the Emily. Uh, I'm going to try to read this the way I think it's supposed to be read, the way she wrote it with her dashes and her capitalization, and see if, see if that works. Like rain, it sounded till it curved, and then I knew twas wind. It walked as wet as any wave, but swept as dry as sand. When it had pushed itself away to some remotest plain, a coming as of hosts was heard. It filled the wells, it pleased the pools, it warbled in the road. It pulled the spigot from the hills and let the floods abroad. It loosened acres, lifted seas, the sights of centers stirred. Then like Elijah rode away, upon a wheel of cloud. winter afternoons that oppresses like the heft of cathedral tunes. Heavenly hurt it gives us. We can find no scar. But internal difference where the meanings are, none may teach it, any. It is the seal of despair, an imperial affliction sent us of the air. When it comes, the landscape listens. Shadows hold their breath. When it goes, it is like the distance on the look of death. We've got a two for Emily's happiest poems. That's what it says right here, happy poem. <laughs> it says big Very happiness sweet. poem, actually. <clears throat> I taste a liquor never brewed from tankards scooped in pearl. Not all the vats upon the Rhine yield such an alcohol. Inebriate of air am I, and debauchy of dew. Reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more. Till seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run to see the little tippler leaning against the sun. Okay. I'd say it's 
is uh, Joe talking about pathologizing women. Uh, I saw a young woman on the bus uh, yesterday, I think it was. She had a button that said, I don't have PMS, I'm bitchy all the time. <laughs> and I told her, you know, I'm a recreation therapist. I work in mental health. Do you know that in the new DSM, there is now a disorder, disorder, called PMDD, postmenstrual dysphoric disorder. <laughs> Ladies, you are now pith pathologized for being female. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, yeah. Now they've made hysteria officially a disorder. Ladies, what do you call it when it's a man that has it? Uh, they don't have one for that, so it's official now. Whiny. <laughs> Whiny, <Blimey. Blimey>, yeah. <laughs> uh, you gotta be schizophrenic or something to have that for a guy. Okay, here we go. This is my favorite Emily poem. I shall know why when time is over, and I have ceased to wonder why. Christ will explain each separate anguish in the fair schoolroom of the sky. He will tell me what Peter promised, and I, for wonder at his woe, I shall forget the drop of anguish that scalds me now, that scalds me now. in the soul, and sings the tune without the words, and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could have bashed the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. understand her point here, but uh, so gay, a flower bereaves the mind as if it were a woe. Is beauty and affliction then? Tradition ought to know. Say it again. Yeah, yeah. So gay, a flower bereaves the mind as if it were a woe. Is beauty and affliction then? Tradition ought to know. She's, uh, I'd, I'd like to get some thoughts on that. What reminds me? What are we doing? They're on the root. You know, tradition. <laughs> is, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it something in between? I don't know. You know? But the question is about beauty. Is, if, is beauty an affliction? And I, well, I don't yeah. know if I get the connection between whether beauty is an affliction and why tradition ought to know. It's also perception. Is it um, maybe tradition as in uh, oppression through history? Explain that. Like um, beauty as in uh, through, throughout history, uh, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Um, Maybe it has to do with community standards. But yeah, a double standard. All think is supposed a to be beautiful. A double standard. You right. know, what everybody thinks is supposed to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, um, if you look at beauty historically, culturally, beauty is um, dictated and uh, connected to money and riches. So beautiful in different places, there's no single measure of beauty. Um, but I'm not sure if Emily Dickinson was hip to that in uh, the 1850s. But you also, so gay a flower bereaves the mind. That word bereaves, um, I think carries a lot of weight and connotation. And it, it puts us, uh, well in my mind it puts me in kind of a funeral. And there's that. Uh, and if you wanted to take the kind of Greek idea, 
of um, moderation. Anything that sticks out is trouble, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if it's too beautiful, you know, it's a, it's a bereavement, as if it were a woe, is beauty an affliction? And then you go back to, I think, your idea of tradition. And, and traditions, sometimes based on what we always do it that way, instead of anything that's really worth following. So well, I, I think she's being a little sarcastic and yeah. twisting us around. Maybe the, I, I get the question is beauty and affliction. I, and, you know, I, I think personally I've experienced that, yeah, in a lot of cases it can be. Um, People hate you because you're beautiful. Well, they, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's the same one. But, but yeah, there is that. But, but the last sentence is, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I get, it, you know, I guess it, maybe she was in a foul mood this day or something. Well, I, I think but, maybe she's, she's poking, making you wonder. If it's like, Tradition, I, I want to know, but it doesn't. Yeah, I don't think she's giving any answers. I think she was just asking you to make a question. Yeah. I, 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 I'm tempted to turn it around and say that it's, it's, it's actually about stating her confidence in her own perceptions. Tradition ought to be able to tell me what this feeling means when really it comes. So, ah, yeah. Yeah. there's a, a, a yeah. famous poem by this book, and I'm going to book this against the gentleman. Mm -hmm. Well, that's nice. Uh -huh. um, well, she's got mocking keys, the only truth is being you. Right. That is only, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to get in. Keats, right? Yeah. Truth is beauty, beauty, truth, and that is all you need to know. And she's also got that poem of, yeah. I died for beauty, and then she meets the guy who died for truth. That's right. And the, the, the mosque covers up their name. Yes. <laughs> and it becomes I think some, arbitrary. Sometimes there's a tension between tradition, meaning the, uh, the whole the house of uh, poetry, so to speak, and the individual poet writing something beautiful. Sometimes something beautiful is recognized as beautiful in its own time. Um, maybe she wrote this after her uh, poetry got rejected? Uh, I see a lot of sarcastic. Uh, people who set themselves up as an authority on what beauty is. I remember she was a mystic and she wanted, as you said, her own perceptions were her main measure right. rather than what people told her. Is it an affliction for that young Thai lady to be beautiful right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Once the ad is appropriate. All right, Cliff out. <laughs> there is a pain so utter it swallows substance up then covers the abyss with trance so memory can step around, across, upon it as one within a swoon goes safely, where an open eye would drop in bone by bone. Mm, that's pretty creepy. I can see why they did that. <laughs> <laughs> Which was kind of awesome. Um, I like that. Actually, she wanted that paper. Yeah, that would actually be better. So, um, yeah, I picked 166 from this edition, but actually, Sometimes they're numbered differently. Like in Rob Sands edition, there's a different 166, and they're all great. But <laughs> this one has a kid in it, and I have a kid, so it makes sense to use it. Oh my god, all in <laughs> I met a king this afternoon. He had not on a crown and bead. He had a little palm leaf hat, was all. And he was barefoot, I'm afraid. But sure I am he ermine wore beneath his faded jacket's blue, and sure I am the crest he bore within that jacket's pocket too. For twas too stately for an earl, a mark he would not go so grand. Twas possibly a zar <coughs> petite, a pope or something of that kind. If I must tell you of a horse, my freckled monarch held the rein, doubtless an esteemable beast, 
but not at all disposed to run. And such a wagon, while I live, dare I presume to see another such a vehicle as then transported me. Two other ragged princes his royal state partook, doubtless the first excursion these sovereigns ever took. I question if the royal coach round which the footmen wait has the significance on high of this barefoot estate. What do you think that's about? What do you think that's about? Um, I think it's kind of, it's about um, the barefoot estate. <laughs> <laughs> and what's that? Well, okay. So it's a charming actually, story. It's the first time I've read this poem. Yeah. So I don't really have like a sophisticated interpretation of it. Uh -huh. But so she basically, if we're following the narrative, she like meets a kid on the, on the road. And then they're transported through this kind of imaginary, like, like uh, interaction. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, and she's saying like, you know, so basically like, okay. majesty can be found in just like barefoot children running around. Yeah. It seems like a kind of Christological figure to me. Oh yeah, they're yeah. definitely like with the yeah. palm hat and yeah. there's definitely yeah. yeah, there's kind of a seasonally appropriate yeah. indication in yeah. Great for the randomizer, huh? Yeah. Randomizer for the win. I'll believe anything. Yeah, you will. I just want to preface this with a couple of things. Uh, the pos the possibility of death, um, actually held Emily's imagination. She called death that bareheaded life under the grass. And uh, I think two things point to the fact that uh, she was probably afraid of it, uh, couldn't confront it. One was that she was most prolific in writing her poems during the Civil War, and that is exactly when the bodies of local soldiers were coming back to to Amherst to be buried. So she said, um, this comes from a letter to Higginson, I had a terror since September, I could tell to none, and so I sing as the boy does by the burying ground, because I am afraid. So, uh, and physically the, the image that I recall that showed her fear of death was that her father was actually, when he died, laid out uh, in state, kind of, uh, on the ground floor, and Emily actually did not come down. She stayed uh, hidden in her room. So, uh, in this poem, like some others, has to do with death. It's called, I Heard a Fly Buzz When I Died. I heard a fly buzz when I died. The stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. The eyes around had wrung them dry, and breaths were gathering firm from that last onset when the king be witnessed in the room. I willed my keepsakes, signed away what portion of me be assignable, and then it was there imposed a fly, with blue, uncertain, stumbling buzz between the light and me and then the windows failed, and then I could not see to see. And that's it. Four seventy nine. What's your line? It's uh, she dealt with pretty words like blades. She dealt. <laughs> she dealt with pretty words. Her, she dealt with her pretty words like blades. Yes. It's okay, I'm going to read a chunk of one of her letters oh, as a sort of preface. Um, I sort of don't feel that Emerkinson could be overpraised. Um, I think uh, American poets are really the, probably the reason they ended up living in America, and I mean, it considers foremost of them for me. Um, so this is, one, this is from one of the, the three master letters, these strange letters that were found in the papers after her death. Uh, no one's quite sure who they were meant for. Maybe Sue, maybe 
Oh, just lost, maybe somebody else. Um, she addresses it to this master, and she calls herself Daisy throughout that. Uh, my fitness, like, even though she never published, I think she sort of knew exactly the sort of impact her work, her writing could have on the reader, the listener. Um, and the, both these extracts show that. Uh, she was obsessed with volcanoes. Uh, Vesuvius yeah. don't talk, Etna don't. One of them said a syllable a thousand years ago, and Pompey heard it and hid forever. She couldn't look the world in the face afterwards, I suppose. Bashful Pompey. Tell you of the want? You know what a leech is, don't you? And remember that Daisy's arm is small. And you have felt the horizon, haven't you? And did the sea never come so close as to make you dance? Okay. And uh, the poem is, uh, she dealt her pretty words like blades, how glittering they shone, and everyone and bared a nerve or wantoned with a bone. She never deemed she hurt, that is not Steele's affair. A vulgar grimace in the flesh, how ill the creatures bear. To ache? To ache is human, not polite. The film upon the eye, mortality's old custom, just locked up to die. The mind lives on the heart. The mind lives, lives on the heart. On the heart. And uh, I guess what appealed to me about this was uh, it noted some duality, some complexity, uh, that there is collaboration, even though, uh, well, even though somebody thinks it's the boss. And, uh, and I also think, too, uh, it's an important uh, note or an important remembrance here to, to you, one must feed themselves, so we don't all just happen, we don't all just occur, we have to feed ourselves with our hearts and our minds, right? So that's what I, this was my short reading of this. The mind lives on the heart like any parasite. If that is full of meat, the meat is fat. But if the heart omit, emaciate the wit, the ailment of it, so absolute. Thank you. One sister have I in our house, and one a hedge away. There's only one recorded, but both belong to me. One come the way I came, and one wore my past year's gown. The other, as a bird, her nest builded her heart's mouth. She did not sing as we did. It was a different tune. Herself to her music, will be of Jew. Today is far from childhood, but up and down the hills, I held her hand the tighter, which shortened all the miles. And still her hum the years among, deceived the butterfly, still in her eye the violets lie, molded this many may. I split the dew, but took the morn, I chose the single star, from the wide night's numbers, Sue forever. I can only imagine, I've literally only just uh, found this thing not five minutes ago, and I can only imagine that uh, between her sisters, by the sound of this poem, not sure how many she had, I literally only learned about her last week when our good friend here visited my apartment and told me of this Emily Dickinson's uh, get together. So I can only assume that one, she had two sisters, one of which was much more closer to her heart, and for this tune, she, for this poem, uh, one was closer than the other. That's all I can derive from that. I mean, you have tried anything more deeper. I salute you. Yes. I believe Sue was her sister in law. Right. Sister wife, and she was very, very close to her, and they lived right next to her. Yeah. That was a video. I literally just forgot that. She was the close sister in law. Yeah. Lavinia was her blood sister. Uh, in yeah. Ephesus. She shared a room with her sister, but she was close to her she sister. Was sister. We haven't determined how close yet. <coughs> We're still talking about it. Up for debate. Are you kidding? It's always up for debate. <laughs> debating the validity of her past. And uh, I think that's it for me. Yeah, right. On. Thank you. Well, we've got a little more time. Anybody else feel compelled to uh, 
Jim Davis, you got to read one. <clears throat> Much madness is divinest sense to a discerning eye. Much sense the starkest madness. Tis the majority in this has all prevailed. Ascent and you're sane. Demur, you're straightway dangerous and handled with a chain. Right? And well, we're going to uh, sing a song after you do this. Oh, we're going to sing a song after, and then our traditional ending, um, traditional because it's going to be the second time to do it. But at the end of these things, uh, our first thing similar to this was uh, Howl by Ellen Ginsberg. And we have the repeated phrase in the final movement of Howl, uh, I am with you. So at the end of our service today, I'd like you to turn to each other and say, I am with you in solidity. And um, another one of my favorite uh, Emily Dickinson poems, because of the gorgeous ending, is number 236, Some Keep the Sabbath Going to Church. And appropriate for this Palm Sunday, Sabbath, Sunday Sabbath. Some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying at home. With a bobolink for a chorister and an orchard for a dome. Some keep the Sabbath in surplus. I just wear my wings. Instead of tolling the bell for church, our little sexton sings. God preaches a noted clergyman, and the sermon is never long. So instead of getting to heaven at last, I'm going all along. <laughs>